Gregory, good morning. Welcome to Coffee with Climate Leaders. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with my cup of coffee at the ready. Oh, uh, good for you. I have mine too. Friday morning, I, I need this little cup of joe here. Um, so, Terry, I've known you for a while, but in preparing for this, uh, for our coffee, I did a little bit of research on your background, and I was struck by the realization that you've been at the center of many environmental initiatives and activities in Southern California, in the state of California, and globally. And so just to highlight a few of your accomplishments, uh, you were appointed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to be Secretary of Cal EPA, and you are a driving force behind the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, which established cap and trade in California. You also co-founded the R20 Regions of Climate Action, which is an international public-private partnership that implements sustainable development projects. You advise numerous businesses on sustainability and green investing, as well as assist governments and foundations with climate solutions. So you've had this trailblazing career working with some of the real pioneers in the US and the global climate movement. What have you taken away from those experiences in terms of what it takes to raise a level of climate action and ambition that is so sorely needed now? Well, I think the two things. One is something that Arnold Schwarzenegger always talks about and certainly taught me, that there is no such thing as the self-made man or woman, that, that every one of us uh, gets to where we are. And, and it was nice of you to list some of those accomplishments, but every one of us gets to where we are because of many other people that contributed to our success uh, or to us becoming who we are today. And then related to that is the notion that we can't do this alone. No country, no city, no individual, no group can possibly tackle climate change and the sustainability challenges of the planet alone. And uh, so, you know, for example, when, uh, when the United States was kind of using China as, a, as an example of why we shouldn't take climate action because China didn't, um, you know, that's, that sort of thing is really silly because we're all in this together. Everyone's suffering the impacts of climate change as we see that today. Now, of course, unfortunately, it's our country that is turning backwards on climate solutions and sustainability solutions. Um, and, uh, and once again, the rest of the world is moving forward and will welcome us back when that time comes. But Bottom line is we're all in this together and, um, and it really does take everybody putting an oar in the water to get the boat to move. Uh, well said. Uh, we're also seeing a convergence of the climate, economic, health and inequality crises. What are your thoughts on how we build back better? We absolutely have got to pay attention to environmental justice issues. It was something when uh, I was EPA secretary in 2004 and five, we had an environmental justice working group so that we could be aware. That's the first thing is, I don't think most people understand uh, what the people uh, of color and low income in particular are suffering around the world. You know, we, we've seen it here in the United States where it's very often uh, communities of color and low income that live downwind of the most toxic refineries and dump sites and so forth um, and, and have the, the smallest political voice to, to advocate for change. Um, and it takes way too long. And uh, of course, in other parts of the world, for example, when uh, Hurricane Harvey struck uh, Houston a couple of years ago and 38 people tragically lost their lives and there was billions of dollars of property damage, at the same time, thousands of people died in Bangladesh uh, from a, a similar uh, uh, climate change exacerbated uh, storm uh, and flooding and 40 million were displaced from their homes. I mean, uh, and, and that didn't get a whole lot of attention. So we really need to understand uh, how the least among us are, uh, are being impacted by these issues so that all of us can move forward together. And so it starts by listening. It starts by really opening our eyes to these issues uh, and inviting the representatives from these communities into our deliberations about solutions and prioritizing their needs because that really is the beginning of our needs. So how do we get uh, finance to scale up these climate solutions and make the changes that we need to to address these inequalities? How do we bring investors to the table? You know, part of my uh, background when I left state government and we started some nonprofits, as you mentioned, the R20 and so forth, and I'm 
continue to serve on those boards on a volunteer capacity. Uh, obviously, that doesn't pay the bills. So I went into uh, venture capital and private equity uh, in some firms that were focused on sustainability and climate solutions and had a firsthand seat uh, to understand what investors are looking for, whether that's institutional investors like our California pension funds or high net worth individuals. I've had the opportunity to work with Arnold, for example, and Leonardo DiCaprio and other uh, uh, people that of high net worth who want to put their own investment money where their mouth is. And so the first thing you understand is that, generally speaking, money doesn't like risk. So we have to demonstrate that these climate solutions are things that, uh, that actually are not that risky, and especially the things that we know how to do very well. For example, there's 26 million streetlights in America that haven't been retrofitted with uh, LEDs that would save energy, reduce pollution from uh, that energy production, and uh, would pay for themselves, the retrofit would pay for themselves from the savings. Um, and, uh, and so creating a fund or a, even a government program with a, a loan guarantee at the Department of Energy, for example, there's no reason we can't do that kind of thing and show investors that there's real opportunity here and actually not that much risk in many of these things. So um, as well as a retrofitting existing systems, is there any emerging technology that you're excited about? Yes, uh, anyone who has listened to me in recent years knows that I get on my soapbox about waste. Uh, because every single day we send billions of pounds of, of material to landfills or incinerators or in the developing world, often just dumped by the side of the road. And all of that is material that could go back into productive use. In fact, over 90% of what we throw away could be productively reused with the right technologies. So I'm very excited about the idea of ending the concept of waste and using a lot of these new technologies to do it. That's very exciting. Is that happening nationally as well too, or is it? It's happening sporadically. I mean, in the Bay Area, there's several of these high-tech uh, MRFs, material recovery facilities. Uh, Austin, Texas has one here in Los Angeles, as I mentioned, there's several. And that's starting to grow around the world. Europe is picking up on the idea because even in Europe that has been much better at recycling than in the United States or elsewhere, they're only at about an average of 40% of what could be recycled is actually getting recycled. Technology can do over 90%. Mm -hmm. So technology is just better than humans at doing this. And so I think we're going to see in the near future going back to one bin, which will be more efficient. There won't be multiple trucks picking up multiple barrels on our streets and alleys. Uh, we'll go back to one bin and let technology sort it out. And, uh, uh, and so all around the world, people are starting to get the idea. Through the R20, we actually introduced these technologies to the country of Algeria and uh, brought them over here. Uh, they were thinking about buying a lot of incinerators to deal with the waste in their country, in, the, in their big cities. And we showed them how, in fact, you could create a lot more jobs and a lot more economic value if you turn that stuff into something useful. So uh, now in uh, several of their big cities and regions, they're building these material recovery facilities and the conversion technologies to use that material productively instead of just burning it. That's exciting to hear. And thank you so much for continuing to lead on these uh, important environmental and sustainability initiatives. And do you have a haiku that you would like to leave us with today? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I would just direct people to, uh, to my uh, uh, Twitter or, or Facebook uh, posts for, for my haikus. But I will leave you with something from uh, Shakespeare, from my favorite author who said, nature's bequest gives nothing but doth lend. And so when nature calls thee to be gone, what acceptable legacy canst thou leave? Well, I think if all of us get on board the climate solutions and sustainability solutions, especially in a just and equitable manner going into the future, if all of us vote according to those values uh, in local elections and every opportunity we have to, to vote that way, that will leave a legacy of which even William Shakespeare would be writing poetry or maybe even haiku. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today, Terry. I look forward to seeing you sometime in person. Absolutely. Thanks so much for hosting. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye.